Good morning. Scripture today is taken from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 24, verses 13 through 35. And behold, two of them went that same day to a village called Emmaus, which was from Jerusalem about threescore furlongs. And they talked together of these things which had happened, and it came to pass that while they communed together and reasoned, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were holden that they should not know him. And he said unto them, What manner of communications are these that ye have one to another as ye walk and are sad? And the one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answering said unto him, Art thou only a stranger in Jerusalem, and hast not known the things which are come to pass there in these days? And he said unto them, What things? And they said unto him, Concerning Jesus of Nazareth, which was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death, and have crucified him. But we trusted that it had been he which should have redeemed Israel. And besides all this, today is the third day since these things were done. Yea, and certain women also of our company made us astonished, which were early at the sepulcher. And when they found not his body, they came saying, that they had also seen a vision of angels, which said that he was alive. And certain of them which were with us went to the sepulcher and found it even so as the women had said, but him they saw not. Then he said unto them, O fools and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets had spoken, Ought not Christ to have suffered these things, and to enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures of things concerning himself. And they drew nigh unto the village whither they went. And he made as though he would have gone further. But they constrained him, saying, Abide with us, for it is towards evening, and the day is far spent. And he went in to tarry with them. And it came to pass, as he sat at meat with them, he took bread and blessed it and broke it and gave it to them, saying, And their eyes were opened, and they knew him, and he vanished out of their sight. And they said one to another, Did not our heart burn within us while he walked with us by the way? And while he opened to us the scriptures, and they rose up the same hour, and returned to Jerusalem, and found the eleven gathered together, and them that were with them, saying, The Lord is risen, risen indeed, and hath appeared to Simon. And they told what things were done in the way, and how he was known of them in the breaking of bread. Thus in the reading of God's holy word, may it bless his truth into our hearts, and let us pray. Father God, as we come together on this Lord's Day, knowing that things around us are not what they should be, all the sickness from the coronavirus, all the people out of work, for the job shut down. Father, we we just ask your blessing and your your hand in crawling this virus and and getting rid of it that people's lives can get back to normal. Father, we ask you to, to bless each one that is listening to this message. Help them to cope with what's going on around them today and, and help to open up the things that we might get back to normal. But Father, we, we remember that even though we, uh, 
we're not meeting in your house as a group, that the house is, is not the church, it's the people. And we can meet wherever we are, in whatever manner that we wish. And we pray, our Father, that we are meeting and that we are studying your word. We thank thee, our Father, most of all for your Son, who came and lived and died, that we might have life and life everlasting. Yet, as you to be with us now, our Father, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be acceptable to thee, my strength and my Redeemer. Amen. It is perhaps one of the most compelling narratives in all of the scriptures. So fascinating is this scene. In fact, the gospel writer Luke includes it in detail near the end of his gospel writings. It is a story known well and beloved in the church. The story of two disciples walking down a dusty road to the village of Emmaus the evening of that first Resurrection Sunday. Their talk center around the crucified dead Jesus. Their words come out slowly, almost painfully, as they trudge along their way, their feet heavy and their hearts broken. Perhaps one of them said, I can't hardly believe it. In fact, I wouldn't believe it if I hadn't seen it with my own eyes. He is dead. He is really, really gone. Perhaps the other one said, what should we do now? Life seems so hopeless. And then a stranger joins in. Perhaps he's come up from behind unknown to them. Perhaps he has walked along with them for a while without their noticing, but suddenly he is there. I'm sorry, he may have said, but I couldn't help but overhear you. What are you talking about? They stop and turn to him. Other travelers perhaps step around him, anxious to reach their destination before nightfall. And the three of them stand there in the middle of the dusty road and talk. Where have you been the last few days? One of the disciples asked the stranger. How is it that you haven't heard anything about Jesus of Nazareth? And so the two of them tell the stranger what they know. Listen to what they say from our gospel lesson this morning. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he would be one who would redeem Israel. And what is more, it is the third day since all this took place. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but didn't find his body. They came and told us that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see him. I don't know about you, but this story has always fascinated me. This scene between two beloved disciples, disciples of our Lord, filled with sadness and despair, grieving at the death of a friend, telling that stranger how the last nail had been driven into their hope of the future. And their Savior himself, unknown to them, patiently listening to them, his nail-scarred hands undoubtedly he kept under his robe 
so that they did not recognize him. As he heard those words of grief and sadness, no doubt his heart must have been touched by their pain. Do you hear what they are saying? Can you understand what is happening here? For there is a message here for us today. Listen to what they say. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over, sentenced to death, and they crucified him. And we had hoped that he would be the one who would redeem Israel. We had hoped, they said. They might as well have said that we used to hope, but not anymore. Because that's the way they felt. He was dead. He was gone. He had died a cruel death on the cross. But now, it was all over. For those without a resurrection faith, for those who have not yet heard and believed the good news of Jesus' resurrection, for those who do not believe the good news of Easter, death is a terrible thing, for it puts to an end our hopes for the future and seems to erect an eternal barrier between our loved ones and themselves. Without a living hope, without a living faith in the resurrected Christ, like those disciples on the road to Emmaus, we are left to trudge our way along the dusty, dark roads of life, dragging our feet, wondering what we could have done to avoid this. But it need not be that way, because as children of God, as those who know the rest of the story, as those who have seen and have been to the empty tomb, and have met the risen Christ, we know that our death is not the end. We know that there is eternal hope that ours through faith in the living Christ. There's a certain city in Romania which has a burying, burying ground called the Mary Cemetery. M-E-R-R-Y. The Mary Cemetery. The crosses that serve as tombstones are decorated with carvings and paintings and bright colors and even amusing epithets. They express, of course, the Christian belief in the resurrection. However, the former communist government, which wrote the Traveler's Floors, describing this cemetery, and its unique tombstones, until recently, described that Christian hope expressed on the tombstones as merely the expression of a certain philosophy regarding the way of thinking death. A certain philosophy regarding a way of facing death as Christians, we know there is more to our faith than that. Our faith in Christ is more than just a philosophy about facing death. It is a living hope, a living trust in God, a certain faith in the risen Christ, a faith that rests on our relationship with the crucified and living Lord Jesus Christ, who says to us, I am the resurrection and the life. If anyone believes in me, even though he dies, 
yet shall he live. That's why the Apostle Peter can say, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy he has given us a new birth unto a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Our hope as Christian people comes from God and resides in Jesus Christ, who died for our sins and won the victory over sin and death when God our Father raised him from the dead. This risen Savior alone can say, I died, and behold, I am forevermore. I am the resurrection and the life. If anyone believes in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live, and whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. The story of those two disciples on the road to Emmaus is a story of faith reborn. It is a record of hope restored. That's what makes it such a lovely story. That's what makes it one of the greatest stories ever told. For it reminds us that we have a pledge and a promise from our God, a word of hope, a living trust in our risen Savior, something that we can hang on to. Young Helen Keller was a prisoner of her own circumstances. I think we all would remember her. She could not see or she could not hear. She could feel with her hands, but without the sight or hearing, how can she know what she is feeling? One day her teacher, Annie Sullivan, took Helen down the familiar path in front of her house to where the well was that had a hand pump. Someone was there pumping water. Annie took Helen's hand and held it under the water. And in sign language, spelled on her other hand the letters W. A T E R. And suddenly something happened. Suddenly her life changed. Well, in danger of making a really bad pun, we could say suddenly her eyes were open. It was just a little five-letter word. It was just the splashing of common water. But now Helen knew what it was. Now she had a name for it, water. And if that experience had a name, others must also. It was suddenly as if the world had opened up to her. Now she could begin to reach out to the world and experience it in spite of her handicaps. My friends, a breakthrough of equally breathtaking importance happened to those disciples of Christ that first resurrection night. Just as Helen Keller's life was changed, just as her eyes were opened to a whole new world, outside of herself. In the same manner, Jesus came to those two disciples and revealed himself to them and their lives were never the same thereafter. Such is the nature of faith. Such is our resurrection hope. Because he lives, we shall live also and he will walk and guide and comfort us through life. In 1847, a young doctor in Edinburgh, Scotland, made an amazing discovery, one that changed the course of modern medicine. He discovered chloroform, 
And in so doing, he found a way to take the pain out of surgery. Now, everyone who has ever had surgery ought to thank God for Dr. Simpson. For even though we don't use chloroform anymore, we use more sophisticated things than that, but the concept of taking the pain out of surgery was born then. Give a person an anesthetic and they will avoid that dreadful pain of surgery. One day, while lecturing at medical school at the university, a young student raised his hand and asked, Dr. Simpson, what in your opinion is the greatest discovery ever made? It was one of those questions that students sometimes ask to cater favor with their professors, for this student was well aware of Dr. Simpson's discovery of chloroform, and he expected him to say the discovery of chloroform, but he didn't say that. But do you know what Dr. Simpson said? Do you know what Dr. Simpson said? He replied, in my opinion, the greatest discovery a person can ever make is to find the grace of God. And you know, he met it. Not just in a sense of humility, but he met it from personal experience. We know that because Dr. Alexander Simpson and his wife had a little girl, a child they dearly loved. And one day, she was taken ill. And all the medicines in her father's black bag could not help her. And she died. They buried her in a cemetery in Edinburgh. A few months later, they placed a stone at her gravesite. And on that stone, they had inscribed her name, Faith Simpson. And below her name, the dates of her short life. But there was more. They put on that stone, there above the place for her name, they inscribed the words, Thank God for faith. Faith Simpson and faith in God. Faith Simpson and faith in God. The poet writes, The stars shine down upon the earth, and the stars shine upon the sea. The stars look up at a mighty God. The stars look down on me. The stars will shine for a million years, a million years and a day. But because of Christ, I live and love, even when the stars pass away. Such is the hope that is ours in the resurrection of Christ. Such was the trust we have in God, and such is the faith, faith that we live with, a faith of hope and trust that these two disciples discovered on the road to Emmaus that first resurrection day. Let us pray. Almighty and eternal God, our Heavenly Father, we, we pray that each of us have, have heard the message of Jesus and accepted Him as Lord and Savior, and we have faith to follow Him all the days of our life. Faith that will, in the end, lead us into heaven, that we may spend eternity with you. Father, enrich our faith. Enrich our love and our care for you. Help us.
struggles as we struggle in everyday life to find the way that Jesus said is narrow that leads to life everlasting. Help us as we struggle along the way, our Father. For the many times we're out walking these dusty roads in life. And we seek the guidance of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, even more. Bless us as we pray in the name of your Son, our Redeemer, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.